Welcome to this week's uh, Learning Machines seminar at RICE. Uh, today we have uh, Jermud Corcoran from uh, uh, Ericsson, who's an industrial PhD student at KTH as well. Um, he's an expert in software implementation, architectures, uh, actively driving and participating in radio access network software and system released activities. Uh, he has contributed to many key software implementation and system solutions. He's working on methods, architectures, and algorithms for enabling self-learning resource management uh, solutions with a focus on implementation aspects of advanced automation. Uh, so with that said, uh, welcome, Dermot. The floor is yours. As was introduced, my, my name is Dermot Corcoran. I, I've worked at Ericsson for nearly 30 years. Um, I've worked in all the Gs, all the way from 1G up to uh, 6G at the moment. Um, you should see that in the stores maybe around about 2030, but um, I'm one of, one of the few people left in the company actually that, that's actually worked in all the Gs, so, so that's kind of nice. Um, and part-time I also spend uh, yeah, uh, time at KTH uh, doing industrial PhD simply as a way to keep my skills up to date. Um, and one of the things I got interested in was, uh, was the whole area of self-learning systems machine learning and, and how these, uh, how this technology could help us to improve uh, and to automate our systems. So, so this particular presentation then is a paper that was presented uh, two weeks ago at uh, CNSM. Uh, it's a conference on um, network and service management. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of a crossover conference, if you like, between the softwareization of networks um, and future future automation and management techniques. So, so it was actually quite a good agenda for this paper. So this is work then done together with, uh, with me uh, and Par Kruger, your colleague at Rice, and also Magnus Bowman at KTH. Uh, but Par and I have worked together for a lot of years now and actually have written quite a few papers together. So, so we have a very rich and interesting cooperation uh, the last number of years. Um, there's a link to the paper as well and a link to the conference. You'll find it in the presentation there. <clears throat> so, Par, you can, you can switch slides. Thank you. Uh, so, so, some context then. Um, I mean, the use of AI and artificial, radio, uh, artificial intelligence in RON, radio access networks, it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, and we really see there's a lot of potential to improve performance and optimize functions uh, across the network. And in particular, uh, reinforcement learning has turned up uh, as an interesting candidate. And that's because many of the problems in RON, they have a control element. Uh, well, a lot of them have a control element where you have try something and you get feedback and you need to adapt. Um, and also getting labeled data on many problems is difficult to impossible, I would say, uh, simply because the, the kind of data you want to collect is at such low resolution. Um, you know, you, you, just, you just don't have the processing capacity to collect it. And, and then there's also lots of interesting um, legal issues about moving data between regions and operators and so on and so forth. So again, reinforcement learning is, is an interesting solution here because uh, you can learn adaptively um, in the system. Uh, that said, there's many difficult technical challenges and, and these kind of need systematic solutions and well-structured architectures uh, in order to use uh, what I would call these new AI techniques. Um, and on this page, I reference two um, Ericsson Technology Review articles that's written by me and some of my colleagues. These are more kind of popular science articles or popular technology articles where we describe kind of the key challenges we see and also kind of high level architectural solutions to some of these problems. So if you want to get some industrial context, um, then yes, uh, take a look at those papers. Um, and then today's presentation then is uh, looks at one technical problem that reinforcement learning can help with. And along the way, I, I hope you'll learn what that is. So uh, next slide, Par. So, so uh, an overview then of the presentation. I mean, uh, we'll take a look at the main contributions of the paper uh, as was presented at the conference. I've actually added a little bit extra support material today uh, since we have a little bit more time. Um, so ju just, to, just to help a little bit with the understanding of the problem. Um, what's reinforcement learning? I'm sure you, you know that to death already, so I, I won't say too much about the mechanics of what reinforcement learning is more than, than tell you what it does. 
Um, then I'll spend a little bit more time describing the problem description and the use case because um, I'm pretty sure you're not you're not radio uh, access network experts, so so the whole problem might be a little bit foreign to you. Uh, so I'll spend a bit of time just describing what that is. Um, then let look at some of the related work in the area, what's been done before to solve this problem, how people traditionally solve the problem. Um, then I'll, I'll start to talk about our setup and how we solve the problem, um, both the simulator we built and the system model that we use. Um, then we have a, a particular reinforcement learning method and framework that interacts with the simulator. Um, we've, we've designed a couple of different policy networks. That's our neural network implementation that implements the reinforcement learning policy. Um, and then uh, I talk a little bit about the reward engineering and advantage functions. The reward engineering actually turns out to be a very, very essential area of this problem, something that's not covered in a lot of papers, actually. Um, when, you, when you look at how reinforcement learning is covered in the popular literature, it's kind of hammering at the same old, you know, Atari game area. Uh, but when you start to apply it to a different area, like, like we did here, then, then you, you really need to look deeply at how you actually engineer the reward system. And then experiments and results. And then uh, briefly, next steps. Um, I need to ask, how much time do I have um, before I continue? We, we generally have, have no ending time, but, but talks oh, are okay. usually between... <laughs> between 30 and 40 minutes, and then we have maybe okay. 10 and 20 minutes of discussion afterwards. Okay, that sounds great. No ending time, I like that. Uh, I, I guess it'll take maybe 30, 40 minutes to, to present this, depending on, on, on how we go, and then, then we can talk afterwards. That sounds so, um, so we, all in all, about one hour. Yeah, okay. So, so just to, I, I kind of already gave you a, a brief introduction to the context uh, for, for kind of looking at, um, AI and, and new techniques for our own, but, but then maybe to look a little bit deeper at, at why we started to look at reinforcement learning. Um, and we believe that, that, that reinforcement learning could help us to, to solve complex dynamic optimization problems. And I say dynamic here because things change every millisecond or every couple of milliseconds. Uh, so it's a rapidly evolving environment. Um, it's not like somebody's face. Somebody's face doesn't necessarily change a lot between one millisecond and the next. Um, but the kind of environments that, that I try to apply this to, they're, they're rapidly and dynamically changing. Um, and we believed um, that the, the, the use of policy methods might be, might be especially suitable for what we would call large action space. So, so lots of data in and then uh, quite a wide spread of actions on the output. So it's not just to move uh, uh, an Atari ship left or right or up or down. It's, it's a much wider spread of actions. Um, and then uh, we wanted to gain a much deeper understanding of, uh, of the design and implementation of these policy-based algorithms, um, both the software agent design and the reward formulation and deep neural network design uh, frameworks for continuous learning. That's one of the important aspects of being able to apply this in real context is that um, not only do you train a model, but you need to you need to let that model continue continuously train within a particular context. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the fact that it might be multi-objective optimizations and, and, and we should see what that is in a little while. And then, of course, apply it to a own relevant use case. But But in a way, that's applicable to other use cases. And I think that's that's very much the case in this work is that even though we look at a particular um, wrong optimization problem. Um, the technique is suitable for for many different many other problems. Um, so let, let's go to the next slide. Par. So if you look down at the main contributions of the paper itself, um, it's a reinforcement learning uh, method to derive scheduling policies uh, to reduce intercellular interference and. Um, guessing you probably don't know what that is right now, but it should become clear a little bit later on when I describe the, the actual problem. Um, and then it, we can balance system throughput, energy utilization and fairness. And that's this multi-optimization side of things. It's not just one thing, it's several things at the same time. Um, and it turns out that by, by, by doing, by, by careful reward engineering, you can actually, um, you can actually engineer um, this, this kind of multi-optimization side of things. Um, and then uh, we can show pretty clear and significant gains in terms of the measurements, at least in our simulator. 
Um, it's not for sure that it's the same thing when we put that into a live system, but but uh, of course, a simulator is, is also is always a good place to start. And along the way, we built a fairly competent simulator that we we feel pretty strong, you know, confident about. Um, there's extensive empirical measurements demonstrating the method's potential uh, in pretty challenging network scenarios, and and that that's kind of important to mention about this paper. It, it's very result, it's very kind of empirical and result heavy. Uh, so quite a lot of it is presenting results of experiments where we try to use the technique in, in different scenarios, if you like. Uh, and then there's also the, and this, what I mentioned before, incremental and continuous learning, where we would pre-train an agent in a simulated environment and then transfer that agent into a live system uh, and let the, let the agent continue to train and update the policy uh, to act in, in if you like to, to learn the exact context of, of that uh, environment. Um, and that's simply because uh, in a simulated world, world we, can never, we can never be sure exactly what's gonna happen in the real world. So a simulator will, will get you 80% of the way, but to, to, really, to, to really optimize in the last 20%, you, you have to have some kind of local um, training and optimization. Okay. So if you take the next slide then. Yeah, okay. I, I just yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, perfect timing. Um, so, so then, what's reinforcement learning? Um, by the way, can you can you see my pointer if I if I move it along the, along the screen? No, I can move the pointer if you tell me how to move. But it, it. Yeah, it's okay. I, I think that might be a bit a bit tricky. Yeah. But uh, I mean, basically, then, um, I mean, uh, reinforcement learning. It's it's about an agent interacting with an environment. Uh, and this environment produces some kind of a numeric reward, uh, as, as is kind of visualized in the picture here with agent producing an action into the environment. The environment updates a state, so, so there's some change in the, in the observable state that, that the, the agent is monitoring and, and some indication of what the environment thought of that true reward. Um, and then the object, objective then is to learn uh, which actions to take uh, to maximize some kind of a goal, and, and that's often described then as maximizing the expected reward uh, across some trajectory uh, over time. Um, and the learned behavior then is formalized as a policy pie, and there's uh, those of you who know reinforcement learning well know there's many different ways to do this. Uh, in the model free branch, then you, you have the, the, the state or value based approaches like uh, Q learning and all its various different cousins. Uh, and then in the policy based approach, you have a, a whole family of different policy based uh, approaches as well, uh, like reinforce or DP, uh, DPDG or any of these um, advanced policy methods. Uh, we, we, we actually just uh, use and adapt. Um, a version of reinforce, which seems to work pretty well for for our use case, but we've also experimented with with other variants. Okay, um, and then yeah, on, on the bottom right hand side, you, you see this idea then of this agent interacting with the radio environment and the radio environment giving some kind of a feedback, and then uh, the policy is updated uh, in order to try to eventually optimize uh, whatever the goal is you're trying to optimize. So that's that's kind of reinforcement learning in a nutshell. So so then if you look at the um, at the problem description itself, uh, we 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 study a problem that's called cell edge interference management, and this is a really old problem actually in in, in cellular systems, uh, and it's got to do with um, if, you, if you take this this picture there, this B you have some kind of a cell configuration, and the cell has different uh, sectors or beams. That's these arrows, uh, red arrows pointing outwards. That kind of represents an, an antenna beam. Um, and then depending on, on how dense the cell is, depending on what the inter-site distance is in the cell, uh, you can either decide to reuse the complete frequency domain, that's kind of a reuse one, or you can decide to slice up the frequency that you use uh, into the different sectors. So you would give each sector a third, a third, a third of the frequency. Or you might have a policy where you completely reuse the uh, the frequency in the cell internals, um, and then you have some kind of a buffer zone between the between the the, the neighboring cells. Um, and the whole idea with this then is to is to try to minimize the interference between uh, radio beams in adjacent cells. So so this is an interference minimization problem. 
Um, and then there's there's a kind of couple of different dimensions in which you can you can you can do this um, optimization. You could do it in the power domain. That's basically you, you deciding the the output power of the of the antenna. You can do it in the frequency domain. That's a little bit what's indicated here, where you, you just you slice up the frequency into a couple of different portions. Um, or you can do it in the time domain. You can say that this particular beam gets to use all the frequency for uh, the next number of uh, millisecond slots, uh, and that, and so on and so forth. So, so that's the that's the dimensions you have to play with. Um, and and these this BCD this is kind of different traditional way that 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 cells would have been planned, and there's a lot of different strategies that you can that you can use for that, and that all works well. Uh, when cells are put in base, place and basically stay there <coughs> for for a long period of time, but if you start to go towards the, the kind of systems that that we see in five G and even six G and, and beyond, uh, you have much more adaptive systems where you have uh, sectors and cells and beams kind of popping up. So it's much more ad hoc. Uh, so this kind of planning that you see in B, C, and D, it's it would be. You know, being incredibly labor intensive to do this and maybe even impossible as, as some of these cell, cells and sectors might, might appear just for you know for several minutes or hours and then disappear so the idea then is um, can we apply uh, more adaptive or self learning uh, to try to figure out you know given a, 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 an, a, an ad hoc situation like a is it possible to learn um, an optimum way to allocate both how, to, how each of these devices, each of these cells should use its frequency um, and, and at which time periods and, and so on. So that's the, that's the problem. Joe mate, is it yep. okay to, to interrupt you with questions? Yes, the, because uh, then what I think, do you usually do? <laughs> I think usually it's up to the speaker, but usually we, we have questions during presentations, I think. That's that's good. I like that. Um, okay. I yes, think we have a question. Unless, unless, unless we get really bogged down. Yep. Yep. Okay. So can somebody... Yep. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me at least. Yes. 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 <clears throat> yeah. So uh, my question was in, in terms of this particular uh, problem. I'm also from Ericsson, by the way. But yep. in this particular problem, I mean, usually when you talk about reinforcement learning, it's usually solving what's called uh, sequential decision-making problems. So in this particular case, is this actually a sequential problem or can you get the, the optimal policy um, kind of with just one decision or do you need to kind of reevaluate your policy continuously or not? It's sequential in the sense that, um, I mean, if you were, if you were just if it was just each time slot, you can you can you can decide the optimum policy. Um, but in this case, there might be it might be a better decision to blank for a certain number of TTI or time slots. So it's sequential in that sense. If you see what I mean, it's sequential in the sense that it's trying to combine how to how to allocate the resources in a frequency and time sense. Mm -hmm. so if Did I that answer your question? And yeah, I, yeah. Thank I you. have a comment though, because because we are also interest, interested in um, uh, um, obtaining some kind of fairness between different users. That means that we need to measure the the performance with respect to individual users over time. So those those are averages that are taken into account every time frame. So it's a mix between sequential and and uh, average behavior over longer longer term. So this is what yes. we would call a continuous uh, reinforcement learning problem. Right. Sorry. So we we need to optimize the average behavior o over indefinite periods of time, basically. And it's not uh, a follow-up question then, I guess, is that it's not necessarily actually now that i think about it maybe already answered it but maybe so uh, greedily selecting some optimal policy at, at time step t is not necessarily the globally optimal no. decision oh, it's the average yeah. behavior that we measure yeah yeah, yeah. all right thank you yeah good okay so let's move along to the next slide then um this this is uh, just a little bit more information than um uh, to describe the problem so this is a kind of a uh, 
a comic book picture of um, of, uh, of three different uh, cells, uh, each of these sectors having three uh, beams, or each of these cells having three beams or sectors, uh, and you can see that we've kind of set this up then with the with the beams kind of pointing into a zone here where where you have uh, overlapping uh, overlapping um, uh, frequencies uh, and so on. So so that gives you uh, an, an interfering an area of high interference in, in these uh, cell edges, if you like. Um, and then, just for those of you who uh, aren't from Ericsson and, and maybe mightn't have seen um, seen how, how, how this looks in reality before, uh, I mean, the, the radio resources are sliced up, as I mentioned before, in, 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 in terms of frequency, a frequency domain and a time domain. Uh, and, and depending on the radio standard, the, the, the time domain, um, it could be uh, one, one TTI is often one millisecond. It can be less than 5G, but, but for, for the sake of this discussion, let's assume it's one millisecond. So that you're making a new decision uh, on how to best use these resources every one millisecond. Um, and the actual schedule, scheduling decision uh, here that's been decided then is that you have a, a number of these, what's called physical resource blocks. So a physical resource block is this is this slicing in terms of time and frequency. You have a number of these uh, on each beam or sector, depending on the, the amount of frequency you have available. Uh, and then we want to decide which of these to actually turn on or off across all the different beams uh, in order to optimize, uh, in this case, what, uh, the, the system spectral efficiency. So it's the total system, uh, the total spectrum efficiency in the system. Uh, and then, as as Per mentioned, we also have another criteria, which is uh, which is fairness. Uh, can we can we also um, make decisions in terms of how to optimize the system spectral efficiency, but do that in a way that's fair? So I'll discuss that a little bit later on when we get to this reward engineering part, uh, where we uh, we have two examples. We can. Um, we can we can do the reward engineering just just considering maximum throughput. So you, you kind of try to give the resources to the users uh, that will guarantee you best maximum throughput of the system, or or you want to you want to guarantee some kind of fairness. Okay, so 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 that's the problem that's been solved here. It's this it's to learn this uh, physical resource block P or B downlink interleaving schedule in the frequency and time domain to minimize adjacent cell interference. So so this. This, these areas here, um, and then so so we're then improving spectral efficiency over some kind of baseline, uh, and or fairness, uh, and then we also have a, a kind of concept of energy efficiency here, and and our concept of energy efficiency here is that um, given given the the schedule um, produced by our reinforcement learning approach, uh, can we improve the system spectral efficiency um, against some baseline? So in, in our particular case, and I'll describe this a little bit later, later on, the simple baseline that we use is, is using all resources, all, uh, all physical resource blocks on. So that should get a little bit clearer later on. So if yeah, you move to the next, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, in, in this slide, it's, uh, it seems to me that, I mean, um, in, in theory, it can be a decision, new decision, um, every TTI or like, you know, at the TTI level. Um, it could be, yes. So how do you think, I mean, like you normally know, I mean, TTI, it's kind of, um, um, we are talking milliseconds. I mean, usually then, then we assume that, I mean, like the inference engine is kind of very fast. So it can kind of. Um, yes. So, so um, I, I have some information that a little bit later on. I mean, um, you could do it every TTI, but you don't need to. Uh, and I think you can definitely train in a simulator uh, at TTI level. Uh, but then, when you deploy onto a system and wish to use that, probably you, you could you're probably updating this at some other uh, interval. It could be every I don't know 50 TTIs or so. Um, but of course, if you have the if it's possible to 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 update the decision every TTI, that's that's okay too. But like you say, it depends on the actual implementation. The, um, what would we say? Imp the implementation constraints. Yeah, and how many beams you want to control? That's a, a single decision as well. Because the system scales to quite a few beams, but not, uh, I mean, if you have thousands of beams, then, then it's difficult to uh, deploy a, 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 a decision making which is centralized. We will come back to that as well. 
Yeah. Okay, let's move along. I think time, uh, sorry, yeah. time is kind of rapidly disappearing. So uh, may, maybe we don't have to spend too long on some of these slides. I, I can skip over the ones I think are less interesting. This was more for, for the academic conference. Um, uh, I mean, how, how, how are problems like this solved today? Um, and I mean, there's there's many what I, what I call traditional algorithm algorithmic approaches that, that try to solve these these this interference problem in the in the power domain, um, the the frequency domain, and the, the, the time slot blanking domain. There's a whole there's a whole um, if you like standard for 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 how you can coordinate blanking among these different uh, among neighboring cells. Um, and, and when doing this, um, and then coordinating among neighboring cells, just through, through one of the standardized interfaces like XN, this is often called SON. Um, and then it's also possible to, to uh, so, sorry, SON, that's self-organizing networks, if, if you haven't heard that term before. Um, and then it's also possible to, to have one central scheduler that tries to coordinate among all these um, beams and sectors, and that's often called a, a, a comp approach or coordinated multipoint approach. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both those. Um, if you take a look at the paper later, there's lots of references in there. Um, and then there's also been some reinforcement learning approaches in this zone before. Um, people have looked at kind of lower dimensional approaches like using tabular learning uh, to, to, to do some kind of uh, learning in the power domain. So basically learning power intervals um, in, on, on, the out, on, the, on, the, on the beam, on the radio output side. Um, there's even been multi-agent approaches, um, but, they, but they often tend to focus on one small particular problem. Um, what's a little bit different with our one is that we try to, we try to learn all these things at the same time, simply by, by showing, um, simply by ex, uh, exposing the policy and the agent to enough of experience from the simulator. Um, and as mentioned, it, it, it does try to, we have this capability to trade fairness and throughput. Um, and the way I saw the way I saw this being used, and this is maybe a little bit uh, more for those people who understand the, the radio access side of things, is that this wouldn't be a complete um, uh, a complete replacement for RRM radio resource manager scheduler. It's more like a pre-selection phase. So that's a little bit uh, an answer to your question as well, Ikram. How how you would use this? Okay. So if we move along to the next uh, slide. So, so then, um, how did we s approach the problem? Uh, and there's kind of three major components. Um, we built uh, this <coughs> system model simulator, <coughs> and, and this implements the problem use case. Um, the very first incarnation of this was actually done by Lars Rasmussen at Rice. I don't know if you're on the line, Lars, but um, we still use the core core code you did there for for, for calculating. Um, um, Calculating the, the interference uh, matrix, uh, so this is this is done using highly vectorized NumPy Python code, um, and it's a generative model to, to allow interactive training. So that's the simulator side, and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a sec. Um, and then we have uh, the reinforcement learning framework side, and this implements the agents uh, using PyTorch, uh, and also that that has the whole engine for reward design and tuning the rewards. And then you see this typical reinforcement learning interaction. Then we observe action and reward. Um, and then, then we have uh, we have a, a set of uh, components to to allow us to set up experiments. We can set up fixed experiments, so we can set up very well designed experiments where we place the beams and the users in specific setups, um, and also more random ad hoc where we basically uh, let chance decide where to put things. Um, so, so in that, that kind of situation, you could have you could have very unlikely scenarios with um, with uh, two beams and two uh, two uh, uh, you know uh, radio base stations or cells right on top of each other, um, and that's maybe not realistic, but it's it's very interesting to try to understand what the agent tries to do in that case. Um, and then we have to, uh, we have a framework to do tra uh, training and to transfer. Um, to, to do inference on the training, uh, and then to transfer the models um, into a into a system, into a live system. Uh, th that that we haven't experimented with yet uh, so much, or described in the paper. But if you look at if you look at some of the Ericsson references I showed you earlier on, you can see the the thinking behind the architecture for that. 
Um, and then we have, we've also used some high performance NVIDIA GPUs for, for the training. So if you move along to the next slide part, yep. this is a little bit more details on the um, actual system simulator. Um, so there's two main, two main parts to this then. There's a, there's a static part and a dynamic part. And the static part, we basically uh, define the, some of the key components we're interested in, like the number of physical resource blocks per beam, the particular antenna model we all want to use, the number of cells, the, the power of the beams, the simulation size, um, number of beams and devices, and, and so on. Um, and then we have a dynamic part that kind of uh, evolves, if you like, um, and that that's, uh, that has components like a propagation model, a fast fading model, um, the actual schedule. So this is the actual thing we're trying to learn in this case, the PRB schedule A. So that's a grid of, of, of schedule of, of which resource blocks, blocks to turn on or off that I pointed out earlier on. And then schedule type, uh, if we want to uh, train for maximum throughput or proportional fairness. Um, and then out from this, then we're, we're seeing an observed state space and also some uh, some measure of uh, system spectral efficiency. Uh, and if you look into the paper, then there's lots of references for where we pulled all of these different components from. Uh, we used a lot of uh, papers uh, and existing open models in terms of how to build these things. So uh, I would describe the simulator as pretty competent today. Okay, if you take the next slide, um, and this is the reinforcement. Oh, Maybe maybe back up for a sec, part. Uh, I need to just mention that um, that in our particular model, then uh, the maximum effective system spectral efficiency is uh, four point six bits per second per hertz. So that's just the maximum uh, that we can train towards in our system, particular system implementation. Um, in reality, that can be very different and even a lot more, just depending on the whole radio technology that you've used and. and how many MIMO beams you have used and a lot of other things. Uh, but that, that's not particularly important for the point of view of this particular experiment and setup. Okay, you can, you can move along to the next slide. So then the reinforcement learning method and algorithm. <clears throat> so the system model then um, interacts with, with our um, reinforcement learning framework. And as I said, it's a standard reinforced with adaptions. Uh, along the way, we did experiment with, with Q learning and we did also look at some more advanced uh, actor critic um, um, solutions, but uh, actually found this reinforce in its simplicity to be to be just as good, actually. Um, so, so the idea then is that the, um, the, the, the system model shows a state and, and in, in our case, it's a, it's, a, it's a set of sinar measurements. Um, and then um, our reinforce will will sample uh, from a policy f at first very randomly a set, uh, an action uh, for, from from the policy using the state as input. Um, it then applies that action to our system model. Um, that's line eight, uh, and then we'll derive some kind of reward from that. That's line nine, uh, and then then we'll record a trajectory. And then every, every so often we'll, we'll collect a number of these trajectories and then every so often we'll batch together a number of these and then update the policy based on the experience that's captured uh, in those trajectories. So uh, I, I apologize, I, I can't point uh, at particular lines of code, but the, the, the basic uh, loop is kind of simple um, that you, um, you sample from the policy, you apply the action that you've sampled from the policy into the system model, you collect the observed uh, okay. reward, um, collect the object, the, 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 the trajectory, uh, and then you batch together a number of those and in that batching period, then you update the policy. So presumably, uh, presumably if, uh, if you're succeeding here, your policy is going to get better and better at selecting the right actions uh, given the particular state that you're seeing. So you have this particular SAR uh, state action reward uh, loop. Okay, uh, maybe that's enough said about that slide. Um, there, there, yeah, there's, sorry, Perry, if you go back. Um, there, there are maybe some critical uh, implementation adoptions that we found to be 
particularly important along the way. Um, the first one is the, 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 the target part that that's related to the uh, whole area of um, reward engineering. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Also, the number of episodes B that's collected uh, before updating the policy turns out to be uh, rather important. And then also the how you, how you, how you update the actual, uh, how you calculate the mean uh, per batch. That, that's also a, a critical uh, point. So if you move along to the next next slide, and all the details that are described in the paper, so you can look in look in there for for more on that. Uh, we also um, so then the, the policy network itself um, that's implemented as a as a neural network, um, and we uh, experimented with two particular kinds. Um, the first is is basically we read off uh, we re read off the state we read off the action space directly. Uh, from a sigmoid output, um, so so on the input space, you, on, the, on the input side, you have a you have the state space as input, um, and on the outs, output side, then you're reading off the PRB schedule, uh, which is basically uh, reading off the resource blocks to which resource blocks to silence and which resource blocks to to use. Um, in in the softmax case, uh, we're we're kind of uh, doing a categorical. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a categorical sample. So um, we're, we're going from, we're, we're selecting one particular action and that action then needs to be decoded back into a PRP schedule. So then there's, there's, a, there's a number of advantages to, to why we do one or the other. Um, the, 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 the sigmoid is, is easier or you, you can directly read the output. Um, the, the, the softmax, we, we've also done, a, if you like, a specific domain optimization there where we slice uh, the input uh, so, so that the, the, the input space is, is reduced uh, in, in comparison to the, the, the sigmoid case. Uh, so the paper kind of uh, shows some results and comparison of how, how we compare those. Okay, do you, do you want to say something about this particular part there? Well, uh, only that the slicing can be applied to the to the sigmoid uh, case as well. So, so that's uh, it's uh, the slicing uh, consists of considering just a single resource block, and then uh, just uh, so solving many such problems simultaneously in the network. Uh, it was necessary for the softmax to be scalable, but it can be applied to the to the uh, sigmoid style network as well which then becomes uh, even more efficient, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I don't think in any way we claim we have the best architecture here by any means at all. Um, no. But we, we have efficient architectures, at least to, to show pretty good, uh, pretty interesting results. They're not very okay. deep and they're fully connected, which is like uh, something that you used to do 10 years ago, but it works well enough for this case. Okay. Um, let, let. Uh, one question, uh, sorry. Um, the PRB yeah. schedule, um, do we mean like uh, max scheduling or is this something different? Like um, so no. Um we yeah, well no, it's it's not the same as, as, as a Mac schedule. Um I mean it's it's really it's really this proposal, if you like, for which uh, PRBs should be used by the Mac scheduler, if you like. Okay. If you, it, yeah, it's a configuration of like you know which should be used, uh, which are kind of optimum to use in certain. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. I, I mean, in theory, you could potentially replace a whole Mac scheduler with something like this. <laughs> That's also possible. Uh, I mean, we haven't gone there, and I don't think we would propose that either. Uh, not, not at least that's not what in any means what we kind of propose with this particular paper. Um, but I mean, it's certainly at least potentially feasible to, to, given the right input states, uh, to at least look at uh, replacing a whole uh, Mac scheduler with, with a, if you like, a trained neural, neural network instead. That's, and I know people are looking at stuff like that. Yeah, I think that would be exciting. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's move along. Um, so then, then we have uh, this whole area of reward engineering. Um, and, and we've looked at, we looked at two two types in the paper. Uh, the simplest one then is basically just um, uh, basic maximum throughput. Uh, and, and this is easy. I mean, uh, this is the, you, you just take the sum of, of uh, 
what, what's coming out of the system model in terms of spectral efficiency and normalize it across, uh, across your resource blocks, beams and users. Uh, and that gives you then a measure of reward that you can use uh, that can be plugged into the advantage function. I'll, I'll, give, I'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, and then if you look at proportional fare, that's a, a little bit trickier, but still not very complicated. I mean, you, you maintain some kind of running average for a user uh, and then you take again the, the spectral efficiency um, and you normalize that ac across uh, some, uh, a running average per user. Um, and then the actual the, the exponent here, the weight that you apply to this uh, uh, running average W, uh, I mean, that, that more or less decides the kind of fairness that you want. So you can go all the way from zero, which recovers the maximum throughput objective. Um, uh, and as you increase that, then you, you have some kind of blind equal throughput where you, you really don't care about the spectral conditions at all. You just try to give every user uh, a fair share. Uh, so anyway, uh, proportional fair objective can, can, can be achieved by, by um, nor normalizing the uh, spectral efficiency across this uh, running average throughput per users. And then again, normalizing across the resource box beams and users. Um, and there's potentially many different interesting ways that you can slice uh, slice these reward functions. Actually, um, that that turns out to be almost one of the richest places places to look and to explore when 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 doing this kind of project. Uh, and and this this really then is uh, is just the the policy theorem from reinforcement learning uh, shown in a different way. Um, and in our case, uh, we, we use a, a rather simple advantage function that works for us, where we, uh, we re re uh, record um, the rewards per, per TTI for a batch. And then we have um, uh, a normalization of a running uh, average over several batches. Um, so if, if you like, it's a kind of a baseline approach. Okay, and, and like I mentioned, we, we did apply, uh, we built several actor critics along the way, but I, I, I can say that they they made life better, to be honest. Okay, um, if we move along. Yeah. Question on the, the reward. So uh, yep. this uh, kind of assumes uh, univariate rewards or single scale, scalar rewards. So did you consider yes. doing actual multi-objective versions of this? No. No, this this is uh, the the reward in this case is uh, is a single scalar reward. Yes. Yeah, parameterized by the W weight, of course. Yes, of yeah. course. Yes. All right. Yes, I mean the, the number the 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 reward that you get at the end is a scalar value, but the production of that number is is not is a, is a complex product, if you like. Yeah, sure. Uh, but I mean, people have yeah. been talking about multi-objective optimization in terms of Pareto optimal solutions for quite a few years. If, I mean, you could argue maybe that that gives somewhat more robust uh, versions than you hand tuning weights for different parameters and so on. But maybe, I, yeah, I, was, maybe. Just, I was just curious if, if, yeah. if, if it was something you had looked at. No. Yeah. And no. maybe we should mention this is all full buffer as well. We don't have buffer aware. Uh, so uh, I think if we move away from from this first approach, we would uh, go into buffer aware schedulers rather than multi, real multi-objective, uh, because uh, I think we need to consider what is in the buffers and what are the different users' needs and so on. And if we have delays, we have need to hand, handle that as well. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, let's move along. It's nearly quarter to time is really disappearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. It's it's always much more interesting. So, um, so yeah, and then 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 just to describe the the kind of uh, experimental setup. So as I mentioned, um, a, a lot of this is is around um, different types of experiments uh, using our system model and and the framework. Um, and there's two main branches. There's there's one branch that we call engineered cell uh, configurations, where we set up specific scenarios and we know where we know the, the, ge the ge geography and the positioning of everything, uh, and that's really just to, as a as a solid proof that the method works. Um, and and then then we have a set of experiments using both the maximum throughput and the proportional fair reward uh, in 
on this particular group of experiments. Uh, and then we have another group of experiments uh, that's more ad hoc configurations uh, and if you like in, with increasing level of complexity um, and, and here when I say ad hoc uh, I mean that we, we kind of uh, let the system generate random positioning of the cells and the beams and the users uh, and then let the, let, let the training or the agent figure out what the best way to, 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 to schedule the resources are given that scenario. Uh, given that network scenario, uh, and and again, this this is maybe more for, more of interest for for people with radio background. But we're kind of increasing the number of cells and beams and users, uh, all the way down to to this experiment C, where uh, we have a what I would call a dense random setup, where we uh, we have five cells, um, uh, twenty resource blocks per beam, um, ten users in the system, um, and then every every training epoch or actually replacing the users or putting the users into different positions so you can see that as a uh, some kind of extreme mobility scenario if you like so that so that's the that's the kind of experiments that we have um i guess the takeaway from this slide is engineered and ad hoc and then scaling in complexity okay so let's let's take the next slide uh, and then, then of course, we have a couple of comparison baselines which we which we use uh, in these experiments. Um, so, um, so, so of course, the, the reinforcement learning approach. Then that's learning a schedule, and uh, from that schedule, it's it's, uh, it's it's producing a measure of system spectral efficiency and physical resource block use uh, and fairness as well. Um, and then the simplest baseline. Uh, that we use is that basically we say, well, how would that compare then to just turning everything on? Um, so, so always using all resource blocks on all beams. So we use one, and in some cases that's the right thing to do. If if there is very little intercell interference, then then of course that's the that's the right thing to do. Um, another baseline with which to compare is uh, is a, a random binomial schedule. Um, and in this case, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're generating a random schedule uh, in terms of which resource blocks uh, should be used, but using the same reuse factor uh, as was determined uh, for that net particular network scenario by the reinforcement learning approach. So the reinforcement learning approach um, might decide, for instance, to, to, to do a reuse of 0.7. So that means that it's using 70% of the resource blocks in the system and silencing 30% simply because keeping that 30% silent uh, improves the, the spectral efficiency in the system. Um, here we're in this random binomial schedule, uh, we're allowing a random schedule but ensuring that the reuse factor is, is the same as, the, as this uh, ORL approach. So that would mean, uh, for example, that every beam is, is turning on a particular resource block let's say one third or one half of the time. Right. So yes. those are examples of binomial schedules. So, so right, and, and, and then we're comparing the reinforcement learning approach with, uh, with this reuse one and reuse spin approach. And, and pres uh, uh, there's also a lot of other different baselines that you could compare against. Um, but uh, when, when, for instance, when generating these uh, random network ad hoc scenarios, it, it becomes very difficult to decide uh, a priori on a particular reuse factor, for instance. That becomes almost impossible or, or useless. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so, so this then is, uh, is, is, is kind of some results from the first set of, uh, of experiment type, the engineered cell configurations. Um, and uh, uh, this is a very busy slide, uh, I apologize, but there's lots of interesting information on it. Um, but we set up three, three different experiments, if you like. Uh, the first is minimal interference, and, and here this is really about placing the beams and the users uh, so that we, we really ensure that there's minimal interference between them. Uh, then the interference is I mean, intermediate here, this, this B, uh, is when we set up some of the beams uh, and users overlapping and others maybe in more um, advantageous positions. Uh, and then maximum is basically when we try to, to point everything in the same direction and put all the users in, in that zone. So we, we really have a, uh, an area of, uh, of what we would term maximum interference. So, so that's the three different scenarios. 
Um, and then um, if, you, if you look at the results then, I mean, obviously the, the minimal interference, um, that's uh, here, the, here the, 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 the policy learns to turn everything on. That's 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 really the, the 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 takeaway from that, and that's the right thing to do because in this particular scenario, you really want to, to use all the resources in order to to to, to get this maximum uh, SSE. Um, however, when you start to go towards the the other scenarios, uh, it's intermediate or maximum, then then it makes sense to have some kind of a uh, an interleaving strategy in the schedule in order to to minimize the interference and. Um, if you look at these graphs, or at these graphs here, the so the first one is for maximum throughput, um, and and these numbers here are showing uh, are showing the system spectral uh, it, it gain over two different over the two different baselines. So the, the blue one being uh, reuse one, um, and the, the green one being uh, this binomial schedule, uh, and it, you can see it shows pretty good uh, improvements. Uh, in the area of 25 to 30 percent, uh, and that's pretty significant because uh, a small increase in system spectral efficiency um, has actually a huge economic uh, value. Uh, you, you know, this, these resources are incredibly valuable in, in terms of um, uh, of money and and how how, how they're used. Um, uh, what's what's super interesting, I think, is the proportional affair. Um, and, and here we can see that by, by using the proportional fair um, um, reward, that um, the, the, the actual system spectral, uh, system, um, system spectral efficiency still increases uh, over the baselines by substantial amounts, uh, you know, 15%, uh, nearly 20%. Um, about for the, for the inter, that's for the intermediate case and, and even more for the, for the maximum case. <coughs> Um, and also has a very high uh, fairness, and you, you can see that here in this graph towards the right, uh, where, where this yellow line is is capturing the uh, the fairness from from the uh, from, from the the, the, re the reinforcement learning approach. So, so I think um, I think that 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 really is a, is an interesting takeaway um, that that just by uh, um, adjusting the the, the reward. Um, you can still gain um, the maximum throughput in, in terms of spectral efficiency, but at the same time, uh, ra drastically increase your fairness. Um, so yeah, that's one of the re remarks then, this you know, good reward engineering, uh, the RL approach uh, can elegantly trade fairness for, for throughput. Uh, do you want to add something to that, Claire? Well, there's a lot of things to say about these slides, but maybe maybe we don't have enough time to go into the details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, if we go to the next slide, and I, th I think maybe I'll I'll jump quickly forward. Uh, I'll just mention very quickly. Um, yeah. So that, then we have. Um, if you go to the next slide. So so then we we also have a lot of of these random ad hoc uh, experiments and and. So th this is where we set up, uh, if you like, a hundred different random network scenarios. Um, the blue, the, bl the blue kind of uh, sunburst here is, is showing the the values gained from the reinforcement learning approach versus the two different baselines that I described: reuse one and reuse bin. Um, and you can see that in almost all scenarios, there are a few where where like one or two where where the reinforcement learning doesn't beat the um, the, the the baselines, but at almost all scenarios, it, it does beat them. Uh, interesting is like something like thirty four, where uh, where it, it basically in these in these network scenarios where there is very little uh, intercell interference. Then then of course um, you know there's there's not that much to be learned if you like. So if you move along to the next slide, there. Um, and again, I, I won't dig into the details here. There's lots of experiments showing that the approach works well and um, uh, especially of a special interest to set for actually, if you go to the next slide, um, power. That's, uh, that's this one here where you have, uh, you have this extreme mobility, uh, then you can actually so, show really interesting gains um, using the approach. 
So, um, yeah, lots of very tense experiments. Um, we kind of ran short of time towards the end, so it was impossible to dig into the details of what's going on. Um, but I think the key takeaway is um, that this, this approach does seem to be able to learn um, what to do, in, in, especially in situations where there's a lot of lots to be learned, where there's lots of intercell interference. Uh, so there really is, uh, you know, a lot to be dug out from the learning process. Um, if you go to the next slide, Power, I think we can skip this one. This is another set of experiments that wasn't in the paper. This is, this is worth mentioning, um, that um, it, this, this whole idea of policy uh, transfer and continuous learning. So, so the, the idea in terms of how this would be used in the real world then, uh, is that uh, in similar in in a sim simulation space you have the possibility to uh, uh, to do rich uh, training uh, with lots of exploration uh, and also to do things that possibly would be impossible in a real system since uh, I guess certain actions might have detrimental effect on the system so so you really want to uh, you really want to use a, a rich simulation environment in order to build uh, a policy that's let's say for argument's sake 80 percent effective uh so 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 the this can be robustly trained in a, in a simulator and then transferred into a into a, an actual system uh and in that case then you would have a continuous learning but but using um a sampled approach uh so that you can't you know uh, update policy at the same aggressive rate as you would do in a simulator um but do so uh using some some uh tempered pace that makes sense for, for your particular problem. Um, and not, not discussed in the paper, but, but covered in, in those Ericsson Technology Review articles uh, that I pointed out earlier on. There's also the possible ability to reuse, to, to harvest these models. So if you can imagine that Ericsson would deploy these models into a customer network uh, and that these models would continue to, to learn and update themselves and improve themselves in the customer network, it would become really interesting for us to be able to harvest the result of that back into our data science environment, if you like, in order to improve the next generation of policies that we would deploy. So I think that's a hugely interesting area. Um, so if you go to the next slide then, um, and, and this is the last one. Um, so yeah, I mean, conclusions and next steps then. I mean, I think uh, the important uh, conclusion is that the approach seems capable of learning complex interleaving to significantly reduce system spectral efficiency and energy efficiency. I didn't talk that much about that uh, since we kind of ran short in time, but if you take a paper, it's described very clearly in there. Um, and it can uh, elegantly trade um, different uh, reward targets such as fairness and throughput and perhaps there are better ways to do this using uh, multi-objective rewards uh, that's something we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at for sure um, I think the approach is very generalizable um, I mean right now it, it was it was applied to a problem of intercell interference this could easily be a problem that has to do with um, deploying workloads on a cloud system for instance I, I, I think that would just be just as applicable. Um, next steps then, I mean, currently we train one agent on a cluster of resources and we would like to start to split this into a multi-agent problem. Um, and that's not because we don't believe having a single agent is a useful approach, but um, I think if you really want to scale to very, very, very large configurations, it might make sense to have at least some form of decomposition among the agents uh, and, and let them share and learn uh, between each other. Um, and then this whole area of uh, transfer and continuous learning aspects is, is kind of only touched upon and that needs, I think, a lot more work uh, to learn how to do that. And that's really to, to understand how to, how to use this approach of training in the simulator and then deploying into a system and letting that uh, agent uh, update itself in a live system in a safe way, of course. Um, and then I think the next slide was really just the, the slide where we would have this discussion. Um, I guess that should have been 20 minutes ago. Uh, so I, I don't know where the time went. Um, it's four o'clock. I, I can stay for maybe another five minutes for, for discussions if, if people want to do that. Thank you, Gamrud. Do we have a short question for the speaker? Yes, 
Jesper igen. <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, I, I was more uh, curious uh, about uh, the reward um, again, <clears throat> the reward function, because uh, I mean, t in my experience, the reward function is really the tricky part. So I'm uh, I'm always yes. happy to see a clever whatever clever tricks you've done in terms of your reward uh, function because I just looked quickly at the results and it looked like the spectrum efficiency had a different scale than the fairness for instance so did you put anything um, um, yeah yeah that's they are measuring different things of course I mean this, the fairness is, is really just a uh, a relative measure, you know, using chain fairness, the spectral efficiency is 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 this bits per second per hertz. Um, so yeah, of, of course, totally different um, uh, metrics. I mean, you're you're right. The the reward engineering is is kind of the heart, I think, of of successfully using these approaches. Um, and I think we spent a lot of time tuning this um, to to find the right balance. Um, and then if that can be done in a much more methodical way, I think, I think that's maybe where a lot more work needs to be done actually is, is not, it's not necessarily tuning weights in, 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 you know, neural networks or, um, or, uh, you know, learning rates. It's, it's really about a methodical way to actually define and structure and, and measure, um, re reward, um, and, and the whole re reward engineering process actually. So you're yeah. totally correct. A comment about the, the fairness measure used in the experiments, uh, the, the, the Jane fairness, which is uh, the scale that we use there, it's not, it never occurs in the, in the reward. The, the, the fairness metric uh, is just, is just uh, um, the, the uh, spectral efficiency divided by the spectral efficiency per user uh, over some time frame. So the Jane fairness is measured after the fact, if you understand that. Um, okay. So the scale yeah. of the no. measure of fairness doesn't go into the algorithm. It's, it doesn't occur okay. in, inside the reward. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, it's measured afterwards. Yeah, maybe you okay. can go back to that slide and, uh, and we can show. Uh, so was the reward only the spectrum efficiency then? No. no. If you go, no. yeah, I have to go back. Sorry, <laughs> I'm the one who have the. Uh, uh, where is that one? Uh, Next here. Yeah. So uh, here is how the fairness is taken into account. So we have this, we have this uh, uh, average reward per user, or this TU, and then that is uh, um, exponentiated with the weight. And then you divide the the um, spectral efficiency the, uh, or the the, max, the the transferred number of bits per, per TTI by by this factor here. <coughs> so that's basically the traditional um, um, proportional fair uh, heuristic, which is used in in the reward calculation and the and the Jane fairness is just the outcome of this policy. Um, okay, maybe I'm missing something then. Yeah, so, so the maximum I'm... output is here. We maximize the, the spectral efficiency averaged over beams, uh, uh, resource blocks and users. So here we just uh, divide the spectral efficiency uh, per, um, uh, per user um, uh, by the average spectral, uh, uh, no, the average throughput of that user over some time window, typically 10 to 50 uh, TTIs, to make sure mm. that over that time frame, the users, the users uh, um, uh, have comparable uh, throughput uh, in this full buffer uh, scenario. Mm. Okay. Okay. No, no, I think if you, if, you, if you just look at the traditional formulas for for the, the proportional fair, that's exactly it, except that it's averaged uh, over the over the beams and users and resource blocks of the whole system to get the system something comparable to the system spectral efficiency. Okay. Okay. So that, that the scale is completely right here. I mean, there's no inherent scale to the fairness metric that we uh, use for for the for the result section 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, the reason for why I brought it up, uh, maybe you don't have time, is that in other reinforcement learning projects I've done, uh, it's usually quite tricky uh, to kind of uh, not add, let's call it bugs, to the reward function, where in certain situations, maybe one uh, one of the parameters in your reward function kind of starves out all the other parameters. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we did see we did see that that kind of effect because we also used the the, uh, the um, um, entropy in order to guide the search, and that was difficult to scale against the real uh, against the real reward. Uh, mm. so that has to be tuned quite carefully if we want to use that. So, so we don't <laughs> so we don't optimize uh, um, for for entropy rather than rather than the, the thing that yeah. you are interested uh, in uh, uh, resource. Right, and and that's kind of what I what, what I was kind of hint at there is that there a lot of a lot of engineering and tuning went into this part, um, and maybe I think a lot more structure could be would be needed around kind of industrializing just this particular part because I think when it comes to using these techniques in industry um, most people you know they'll, they'll look at the standard state of the art in terms of tuning a neural network and all the meta parameters around that and maybe miss all of this part which is more important I think. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of comments in, in the chat. Uh, Henrik yeah. asks for a link to the paper yeah, it's, it's on the first page, but we may, you can send it out afterwards, Power, maybe, on your, on your great slide. <laughs> Sounds good. So, yeah. so uh, and, and Alexis comments that, that you can balance, uh, you can dynamically balance uh, different parts of the, of the reward function by letting the policy network input beta 1 and beta 2. I think that means that you make the policy network predict them. Is that right? Yeah, Learn to predict them. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds like the active critic uh, techniques that we actually tried but didn't see a lot of advantage from. Or did I misunderstand you, Alexi? So, so what I meant, can, can you hear me? Because my audio yeah. was a bit off. Okay, yeah, yeah. good. So, so you have a few hyperparameters in your reward uh, that you set by hand, I guess. This W or something that you showed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And I have, I have also looked at similar issues where you have to sort of balance different reward components, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, one option is to to not necessarily set these hyperparameters yourself, uh, because that, as you have told, is difficult to to find a sweet spot. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you could also do uh, is that you you feed these hyperparameters as features to the policy network, yeah. and then during training you sample various such hyperparameter inputs. This means that the policy will learn a behavior which is dependent on these hyperparameter. What that means in practice is that during test time, you can actually specify this threshold after training. Do you see where I'm going? So maybe you want more of the fairness part, then you can just increase that at uh, test that's time. A, that's a neat idea. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has, that has worked in some contexts that I have been in. But uh, yeah. But that I, think would, it, yeah sorry. I think it should work here. I, I think it would work here as well, actually. Yeah, OK. And uh, yet another third alternative could be to actually use multi-objective agents. Yeah. So yeah. I think historically yes. what people have done is to train one agent for one parameter in the in the reward signal and a different agent for some other parameter. And then you either take the average over all the actions uh, and then that will tend to converge towards the rate optimality. <clears throat> The problem with the fairness is that it's such actually something that the operator might want to to tune uh, to, uh, to optimize the system. The more fairness you give to the users, the more costly every resource block use becomes. You know, so if you don't sure. care about the fairness, then it's easy to get a high throughput. If you want uh, the fairness, that comes at the cost, and every operator may want to find their own sweet spot for this particular balance. So it's something that sure. we probably would want to expose uh, as an internal, external control plan. Yeah, sure. Perhaps we should start wrapping up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, thank, you, thank you for the presentation and thank you all for the discussion uh, next week for, for those of you who are still 
in the meeting uh, will be Martin Vilbo will be speaking about uh, FewShot Learning. He's a researcher in the deep learning group at Price. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks for inviting. Bye bye. Bye.